The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable that a woman took and mixed with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had bought, all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good in the baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to him, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. So today for our sermon, we have a guest preacher, Pastor Rebecca Shervin. She is the Bishop's Associate for the Southwest Washington Synod, and uh, she'll share with us a sermon on today's gospel. God's beloved people, grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This is quite an assortment of stories that we have before us today, a buffet of parables served up all at once. The word parable literally means to throw alongside. This is what this gospel reading feels like me to, to me today, a bunch of stories thrown alongside each other. It creates a swirl of metaphors that no poet or preaching professor would condone. And yet, there is method to the metaphor madness here in the 13th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. By tossing all of these parables together, it's difficult to get attached to just one of them. Jesus spoke in parables to describe the kingdom of heaven, or what other Gospel writers call the kingdom of God. The reign of God cannot be contained by one story or image. It's always just beyond our imagination, more than any one parable can hold. So hear these stories together. Imagine, Jesus invites us, a mustard seed planted in a field. This is absurd to begin with since no one would intentionally plant an invasive weed like mustard. This must have been a stowaway seed in some farmer's bag, a seed that grew into the largest shrub in the field, creating space for creatures to make their homes in. Imagine a woman finding fungus in her flower or putting fungus in her flower. This is what the ancient world thought of yeast, a fungus that spoiled everything. And yet, this yeast produced bread for the woman to feed her family, maybe even her neighbors and friends. Imagine a treasure so lovely and lovable and compelling that someone, a farmer or a merchant, sold all that they possessed to make the treasure their own. Imagine fishing with a net so expansive that it brings in all the fish not just the desirable ones, but the undesirable ones as well. These five vignettes, these word images, open our imaginations to the reign of God. 
I think it's fair to say that in Matthew's gospel, like in Mark and Luke, Jesus is pretty preoccupied with the reign of God. After his baptism and his time in the wilderness, he emerges speaking words about the kingdom of God. Repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Through his preaching and teaching and healing, Jesus both announced and embodied God's reign. The parables that we have before us today are so much more than cute little stories for future generations of Sunday school kids. They reveal the very heart of Jesus' mission and ministry. With these parables bouncing around my imagination, I notice a couple of things. First, the reign of God is present here and now. It is not reserved for us when we die, but it has the power to shape how we live. God's reign is present and yet hidden because it doesn't look like a traditional kingdom or dominion or empire. So it's tricky to recognize. We are more likely to be surprised by it, to stumble upon it accidentally when we have no plans to be encountered by the holy. The second thing I notice in these stories is that God's reign is inextricably bound to the ordinary stuff of this earth. Soil and seed, bread, a farmer's field, the harvest of the sea, these are all great, but they all seem so ordinary, so everyday normal. I confess, I struggle with a bit of idealism when it comes to the reign of God. I keep thinking that if I could just get my act together to be part of it, if I could be the person I know that God created me to be, patient and kind and justice seeking, if I could be the model citizen of how someone should behave during a pandemic, or if I could be the most anti-racist person in my community, if I could pray without ceasing, if I could just radiate the fruits of the Spirit, then I would experience the reign of God come among us. But the problem is I keep tripping over myself. I get all tangled up in my own selfishness and privilege, my own fear and doubt, my own impatience and my need for control. If the coming of the reign of God depends on something extraordinary in me, there is little good news. But I remember Luther's words in the small catechism. I think he was right about this. God's kingdom will come with or without our prayer, but we pray in this petition that it may also come to us. The reign of God comes to us here and now in the ordinary stuff of life, not because of who we are, but because of who God is. The reign of God breaks into our world because of God's great love for the world because of God's relentless pursuit of relationship with us, because of God's refusal to let us go. This is what we see in Jesus, God's steadfast saving love in the flesh, in the world. The reign of God is a reign of divine love and grace poured out for all creation, poured out for you. Imagine God like a farmer and that merchant emptying themselves of all of their possessions in order to have what they value most. You are that treasure cherished by God. This broken and blessed world is that pearl of great price for whom God gave it all. In Christ, God emptied God's self so that we would have eyes to see that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from that love. This kind of love, divine love, has the power to change us. When we behold the reign of God, when we are claimed by its power, we find ourselves doing all sorts of things we wouldn't do of our own accord. We sew quilts and masks. We sing and pray. 
We mow lawns and paint houses that aren't even our own. We teach and coach children who aren't even our own. We welcome the stranger. We find the courage to be the stranger. We show up at rallies. We use our voices to speak truth to power. We run for public office. We read books and study issues that are difficult. We dare to hope. We even give away our money. How crazy is that? What this culture values the most, we give away. But when we are in the grip of the reign of God, we are able to loosen our grip on our idols. We do things that are uncomfortable and disruptive and courageous, not because of our perfect faith, but because of God's perfect love and the power of that love and grace to transform us, not just once, but time and time again throughout this life. There is so much more going on in these stories than meets the eye. There is so much more going on in this world than meets the eye. Thanks be to God for giving us a glimpse of the kingdom in Christ Jesus and for the promise that one day all creation will be gathered into God's reign. Amen.